The vote point is encapsulated in the constitution title, that's lots of data. In a visualizing landscape that is resistant to time fortification, do that by right from the point. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yet something curious occurs once one scrolls down the page to read the comments. On both Vimeo and YouTube, the conversation divides into opposing camps. Many viewers discern the intended point of the film easily enough and remark on how the visualization puts the immensity of the border in perspective. Others, however, make references to the Great Wall of China and how this construction project pales in comparison to that one. One commenter, and yes, I am quoting a random YouTube commenter here. <laughs> One commenter writes at length, but it will make sense. Extolling the US-centric ingenuity of those who, and I quote, built the skyscrapers of NYC, reaching down through the island's many layers to reach bedrock and stretching up to the clouds. Those same people who built the interstate highways and the roads, which, like veins in their bodies, allowed the flow of goods and services every place needed. These are the same humans who visited the depths of the oceans and soared to the distant moon. We built machines that hold the sum total of the world's knowledge and built a world wide web to share it with the world. I quote him because this comment sums up the response to this film by right wing viewers. The issue of border fortification is one of infrastructure, a challenge akin to constructing the interstate system or scaffolding the world wide web. Again, bear in mind that this is, in this commenter's formulation, a uniquely American, United Statesian quality. And I'll also cast a brief aside that it belongs in a larger association of the United States with infrastructure within the history of modern art. Although again, I don't think this commenter was going there. Um, but Marcel Duchamp famously wrote in an accompanying piece to his 1917 urinal sculpture fountain that all America has given us are her bridges and her plumbing. So again, you know, a coincidence, I think not. <laughs> Bagley's film is itself a meta commentary on the question of infrastructure. The use of satellite images sourced from Google implicates both the surveillance state and the internet. So for the larger project that I'm undertaking titled tentatively, A Landscape of Necropolitics, I analyze how artists, architects, and designers utilize various apparatuses of state control, such as cartography, archive, infrastructure, and resilience, which I'm happy to talk about that at length, um, in order to rewrite and reorient narratives of exception and crisis in the borderlands. Bagley's short film provides an important vantage point from which to delve into the subject of infrastructure specifically. The title references an unbuilt singular wall in place of the complex system of fortifications and surveillance that marked specific sites, urban areas, and transit nodes. In late 2016, the term wall had become shorthand for an entire political agenda centered on the Trump campaign and its exclusionary rhetoric. Although the calls for border fortification in no way originated in this moment, let's be clear about that. Bagley's film picks up on its escalation during the run-up to the 2016 US presidential election. Build the wall was a common chant at rallies and candidate Trump famously promised a big, beautiful wall for which Mexico would pay. Bagley's film with its sparse visual economy rebuts the double right-wing argument of border crisis and uniquely American ingenuity using only images of land. The vast majority of the film charts a depopulated landscape, the neat organization of rural farmland, the scrub brush and sage of the Sonoran Desert, and of course, the twists and turns of the Rio Grande or Rio Bravo. From the satellite vantage point, the built sections of fence are reduced to a pencil thin line. Dirt roads allude to the presence of the border patrol, but again, no human figures are discernible within the frames. A June 2020 Mother Jones article cataloged the wall's progress, um, reporting that after four years and $9 billion, only 585 miles had been constructed, 285 miles of which was replacement fencing. Yet the same article also states that 300 miles of new fence or wall did go up between 2017 and 2020 in sites such as Calexico, California, Sunland, New Mexico, and even Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument on Tohono O'odham land in Arizona. While it may not have been the solid concrete monolith envisioned by the far right, 
This fortification nonetheless augments the existing apparatus and further organizes the borderlands in terms of infrastructural space. By infrastructural space, I'm following Keller Easterling's influential theorization in her 2014 book, Extra Statecraft. She defines infrastructure as, and I quote, the overt point of contact and access between us all, the rules governing the space of everyday life, end quote. Rather than a specifically built formulation of infrastructure, she casts it as a medium of information that unfolds in time, quote, to handle new circumstances, encoding the relationships between buildings or dictating logistics, end quote. Although the infrastructural spaces that she analyzes traverse the globe, products of an accelerating globalization in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, the U.S.-Mexico borderlands are foundational to this practice. Easterling specifically cites the post-war border industrial program between the United States and Mexico as one of the early instances of a trade zone, one that precipitated the global establishment of extra state, of extra state free trade zones as loci for secrets, hyper-control, and segregation, again, all of which we see in the current formulation of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. My effort here centers on the theorization of the border fence, wall, and surveillance apparatus as infrastructure, and more specifically, as a site for artistic activist interventions in this space. I classify these artworks into three broad categories. And again, the font got a little large on the top one, but they're supposed to be the same size. Um, so material engagements, transportational provocations, and dematerializing interventions. It is important to note that these artworks both predate and respond to the 2016 moment indexed in Bagley's film. As such, they cast the infrastructural challenge of the border as both an immediate political matter and an ongoing cyclical concern endemic to the region. The framing of material engagements comprises work that identifies or resignifies the border as a physical structure. Architect Ronald Royale, in his book, Border Wall is Architecture, writes that, quote, within this enormously expensive and extremely low-tech piece of security infrastructure lie opportunities for the residents of this landscape to intellectually, physically, and culturally transcend the wall through their creativity and resilience, end quote. One work that emerged from this line of thinking is the 2019 teeter-totter wall, staged between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez by Rael Sanfratello and Colectivo Chopeque. Setting aside for the moment the viral nature of this piece and its use of children, both of which are, of course, really <laughs> fruitful and interesting points to consider, I am drawn to how the teeter-totter wall recasts the wall as playground apparatus. In Rael's original book, the teeter-totters, quote, represent the mutually dependent relationship between the United States and Mexico, end quote. The realized version, with its hot pink levers bisecting the metal fence, draws attention to the fence as material fact, while inverting a point of separation into a point of connection. Similarly, La Tapiz Fronteriza, uh, of 2009 by M. Jenea Sanchez and Gabriela Munoz, weaves paper strips directly into the fence, re-signifying the vertical supports not as divisions, but as a structural warp to the paper's weft. The hard metal fence becomes recast as tapestry in the title, with its religious symbolism and connotations of softness and warmth. Finally, Maria Teresa Fernandez erased the border um, in Borrando la Frontera, which um, can't see up there right now, but <laughs> at sites in Tijuana and Nogales in 2011 and 2016, respectively. Images from the performance, and again, this is the one um, from 2011 in San Diego, or in Tijuana, San Diego. Um, images from the performance show her perched precariously on a ladder in a cocktail dress and black heels, using the aptly named powdery blue seashore dreams to paint a section of the fence to match the sky. This erasure casts the border fence as sky, or recasts the border fence as sky, and I will argue returns it to an earlier, more naturalized conception of landscape. By transportational provocations, I contend with work that enacts a symbolic moving of the border. This builds off the rhetoric of portability that I've discussed in earlier research, but in this case, these artist activists are moving not only the idea of the border, but its function as infrastructure. In 2011's The Border Crossed Us, the Institute for Infinitely Small Things installed at UMass Amherst a photo mural of the border fence that typically bisects the Tohono O'odham Nation. 
In doing so, they call attention to the border as an incongruous international dividing line, separating a sovereign nation from itself. For the purposes of this project, however, it is critical that the newly erected border fence functions similarly to its referent. It blocks traffic, orders space, and implements a markedly different relationship between viewers and their surroundings, if only temporarily. Marcos Ramirez Eje and David Taylor's collaboration, Delimitations from 2014, symbolically brings the border back to its 1821 iteration, as described in the Adams Onis Treaty of 1819. The mirrored obelisks they place along portions of Texas, Colorado, and Oregon refer to the border monuments erected between 1891 and 1895 along the current boundary. The monuments enact a different form of infrastructural space akin to the porousness of the zone theorized by Easterling. And there's a lovely forest <laughs> denaturalizing this idea of the border as a desert landscape. So the final category I consider is that of the dematerializing intervention. These artworks, rather than engaging the material structure of the fence, work to undermine it altogether. Tanya Aguiniga, with her augmented reality or AR experience, the fourth wall, or here the AR border wall, allows anyone using her app to visualize the fence in their own space, ostensibly removed from the geopolitical site. The wall rendered into pixels and superimposed upon the smartphone's viewing field takes the often gimmicky aesthetic of AR and imbues it with political urgency. The fence here occupies virtual space, but the resulting images blur the line between material fact and digital fabulation. Along very different lines, I argue that Post Commodities 2015 installation repellent fence enacts a site-specific dematerialization. The group's fence, constructed perpendicular to the border wall between Agua Prieta Sonora and Douglas, Arizona, is comprised of helium balloons, each 10 feet in diameter and tethered 100 feet in the air. Printed with an appropriated indigenous symbol used commercially as a bird repellent product, the balloons take the symbolic weight of the border fence and transform it into a substance lighter than air. In photographs of the installation, such as this one, the repellent fence quite literally supersedes the border fence, even as it relies upon its presence to enact a political critique. I enfold these interventions, material and immaterial, back on to the initial critique implied in Bagley's frenetic borderscape. The overlapping infrastructural framings, those of border security, surveillance, and global communication, signify the ongoing need for an articulation of these at the space of the border itself. This is just the beginning, and I appreciate and look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sharon. Um, and next, my colleague from Boston University, Andre de Quadros. He is a professor of music with affiliations in African, African American, Muslim studies, prison education, forced migration, and anti racist research. As an artist, scholar, and human rights activist, he has worked in over 40 countries and in the most diverse settings, including professional groups, projects with prisons, psychosocial rehabilitation, refugees, and victims of sexual violence, torture, and trauma. His work crosses race and mass incarceration, peace building, forced migration, and Islamic culture. In 2019, he was a distinguished academic visitor at the University of Cambridge. Professor De Quadros. Thank you very much, Kerry. I'm going to start uh, with uh, a story of a little boy and his family attempting to cross the border in exercise of their constitutional rights. The family was smuggled in a perilous boat in the middle of the night. The little boy lost his sandal in the water when a smuggler carried him into the boat. Although he was little, he knew in fear that he had to be silent and to hide his body in the boat. He was aware of the searchlights of the Coast Guard. The little boy with his family made it across and he was in hiding for a while before his family migrated to two white countries in search of asylum. None of these white countries worked out. So the family returned to its original place. 
I am the little boy in this story decades ago. It wasn't easy then to be an asylum seeker, but my, but my life has worked out very well. I've had good fortune on my side that allowed me to be standing here today. I have not been the victim of persistent cruelty. I'm not the child whose shoe is on the beach on the Mexican side of the cruel border wall. I remind myself that others are less fortunate. So while the international displacement emergency reaches catastrophic proportions created by the continuing brutality, colonizing wars, climate neglect by the privileged world, mostly the Euro world, countries like the United States build monumental walls and invisible fortresses with other barriers to keep the displaced away. These barriers we recognize are in flagrant violation of our treaty obligations and stand as reminders that our governments and the big money interests that control them have little stake in the ethics of humanity, let alone in common decency. We have a combination of the failure of, of policy and public virtue. Let me turn now to tell you about my work. I bring the arts and forced migration, forced displacement together, not only on the southern border, more on that in a moment, but also in Afghanistan, the West Bank of Palestine, and locations in the privileged world. Listening to the stories of, this, of the displaced reminds me of the screams that I have heard in prisons in Boston. I cannot unhear, unknow what I have witnessed. Through the creation of narratives, I seek to amplify the voices of refugee and newcomer people experiencing displacement. It is a space for self-authoring by those who are system impacted. This work responds to the fact that refugees face substantial discriminatory assumptions about their experiences, positionalities, and lives that are actualized as systemic barriers to their settlement and ultimately their well-being. The arts are key to disrupting these barriers because they provide a tangible and creative way to reclaim and tell stories and to share insight into their own lived experiences. Part of my work is a research collaboration that I share as co-PI with colleagues at York University in Canada in a multi-year project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, on Canada, which I'll tell you about in a few moments. On the southern border, which you've seen already, in Boston and beyond, we mobilize arts and music-based program delivery to support well-being goals and that can be achieved through understanding, acknowledging, centering, and investing in the lived experiences of refugees. Now to a couple of examples. Um, week before last, I committed, I continued working with transgender refugees in a series of workshops in a shelter specifically for LGBTQ refugees. This is not that space. This is the, um, this is uh, one of the spaces I've been working in the Espacio Migrante in, in Tijuana. This is the, the, the center, a safe house for LGBTQ refugees where I was week before last. This encounter built on an earlier workshop uh, in Tijuana in an LGBTQ shelter where we put the question based on the last lines of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And you know, you know how it goes. If happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? So that was the question that we provide as interrogatives. Um, and we asked this question around a mask workshop. And as you can see, you can see the masks that, that, that we used. As you may realize, masks constitute a powerful vehicle for, for storytelling and expression. The masks acted as representational and reminded them about hiding and concealment. But more than that, the masks allowed them a space to create a story, to share dreams, and to frame situated knowledges and the connective tissues between knowledge and place. They responded to the, quest to the question with numerous aspirations and dreams, as in this slide, 
si ellos pueden transitar libremente por el mundo, porque yo no. In other words, um, if they can do it, if they can travel freely around the world, for example, why can't I? And the numerous questions that emerge from the Summer of the Rainbow song. Uh, these and numerous other questions were recounted and told in multiple ways of artistic narration. In another workshop, uh, in another shelter in Mexico, Mexico, not an LGBTQ shelter, a refugee was determined to share his escape story with us. Um, running through the jungle in Cameroon, he came across a corpse leaning against a tree. He directed a short piece of theater that you can see in this photo. And in this, he told the story of seeing the corpse leaning against a tree with maggots coming out of his eyes. And he couldn't, he couldn't remove, he, could, he couldn't unfor, he could not remember that powerful story. And so he, in this, here you see the short piece of theater that he, that he, uh, uh, that he created to tell the story. The Southern border, is everywhere. It is here in Boston, uh, where last week I worked with newly arrived young refugees from Haiti, what Americans call Haiti. To protect them, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I have no photo, um, but um, I'm going to come back to what I referred to earlier in the, in the project, in earlier in the, my presentation, talking about the, the, the research project. Sing Our Stories is the project that I will be, I'm, I'm one of the projects that I'm working with in Forces Displacement, the funded project, together with my colleagues in Mexico, Palestine, Boston, Toronto, and beyond, we will continue to work on creating opportunities for stories to be told. And beyond that, to study our approach and to engage in continuous reflection on how, to return to my session title, hiddenness can be a space for storytelling through the arts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor de Quadros. Marina Sartori is an architect, visual artist, and scenic designer. She recently received a Master of Fine Arts in Scenic Design from Boston University and also holds a professional Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell University. Marina is a registered architect in the UK and practiced architecture in various studios in London, Paris, Italy, Germany, and Boston, Massachusetts. Most recently, her architectural work consists of designing residential spaces, interiors, and furniture. She has exhibited her work in Europe and the US with most recently a solo show of her prints at Merge Art Center in Stone Ridge, New York. In collaboration with two other artists, Marina was awarded a grant from the region of Styria, Austria, to support a traveling participatory art project titled Stories from the Edge. Marina's title for us today is Theater on the Move, a Pavilion of Exchange and Hospitality. So thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this project proposes a new type of mobile theatrical space that navigates the fine line between a neutral backdrop and a scenic environment, a space that allows for some degree of customization by the participants, giving them a sense of ownership, whether they are the performers or the members of the host community. According to the UNHCR, there are an estimated 26.3 million refugees worldwide, of which a third are children. Many of the children in refugee camps have experienced trauma in their lives and on average will spend up to 17 years in a camp. The traveling theater would allow children in these areas to access the performing arts and help them create stories relating to their own lives. It is a means of contributing to the oral storytelling traditions of these populations, which is being lost because of their displacement. The design of the mobile theater adapts to different site situations and different theatrical genres, bringing theatrical performance to displaced communities. 
Through a spatial and physical poetry, it will open up avenues of imaginative exploration and bring a sense of hope and joy. Some of the questions asked are, how does the physical manifestation of the theater coexist with its context and live in the quotidian world of a refugee camp? How does it actively engage the community in which it is hosted? In order to create a design brief, research was carried out looking at traditional theater spaces around the world, historical and contemporary traveling theater companies, different performance genres, and existing mobile structures. The siting is specifically looking at refugee camps in the Middle East, for instance, Lebanon's Beka Valley, Idomeni, Greece, or Zatari Camp in Jordan. Currently, performance groups go to the camps to perform at the invitation of local NGOs. These are very minimal and simple performances with just a few props and costumes that the performers bring with them. Generally, an audience gathers around the performers in a circle out in the open. Occasionally, an NGO will provide a tent structure for them as a performance space. Entertainment and hospitality are closely linked together in the culture of the Middle East with storytelling taking a central role. Walled oasis gardens are important areas of lush greenery in the midst of the arid steppe. Places of respite from the heat of the sun with cool microclimates providing shade and wind protection. They are irrigated with parallel and particular per perpendicular channels of water. Garden pavilions would often be built over the intersection of the channels of water in the gardens. This afforded a shaded and cool space from which to contemplate the garden, entertain guests, and listen to the soothing sounds of running water or to feel a cool breeze. The concept of the garden is brought indoors through the use of garden carpets, which become symbols of hospitality. Floral patterns on the wall, on the tile work, ajami relief paintings on walls, and geometric patterning and stone inlay work and carving help define indoor garden rooms. Mashrabiya are traditional wooden screens which filter the strong light but also give privacy to interior spaces. Contemporary versions are still made today, sometimes from metal. These are all forms of inspiration for the project itself. So the project. The theater arrives in the context of the refugee camp in its closed configuration. In order to make the mobile theater easily road transportable, the dimensions are close to that of a typical container, eight feet wide by 20 feet long by nine feet high. And this sits on a steel chassis, which can be pulled by a vehicle to its various destinations. The exterior cladding is made of powder coated aluminum panels in varying matte and gloss finishes. The paint is applied in a series of layers in order to create depth in the cladding surface. This gives the exterior of the mobile theater a shimmering appearance that changes with the light. The patterns and layouts are inspired by Middle Eastern tiles and garden carpets. Placemaking is important within the refugee camps where often there is no defined communal gathering space. The surroundings have no real sense of place and need a focal point. In its placemaking capacity, the mobile theater can be oriented in any way that is needed for the performance. It can take advantage of prevailing breezes and the path of the sun. Within the limits of its own structure, it can create an intimate space for a small audience. And when it is opened up in all four directions, it can command an open and expansive space. The mobile unit is built of lightweight aluminum. The interior is lined with cedar planking on the floor and walls and engineered wood on the ceilings. A kit of parts is housed in a series of crates inside the mobile theater. These are unloaded and the needed elements are chosen from the various storage crates. This next series of images gives an idea of how the box opens up. The sides of the box can flip down and extend the floor space. They can flip up and with the use of supporting poles can create an extending roof. Depending on how it is configured, the theater can define an exterior space and platforms at varying heights can be added to create a varied horizontal topography. The theater can be seen as a kit of parts inside a transformable box. Components include adjustable height platforms, soft goods, telescoping poles, and more. Some components are fixed and others are customizable by the performance group or the local community. 
The unit includes recessed lighting fixtures in the ceiling and solar panels on the roof with a battery to store energy. The floor and ceiling also incorporate rails and tracks. The kit of parts includes a set of panels which can be set into the tracks in the floor and ceiling of the structure. They are designed to capture the phenomenological aspects of nature. Some of the panels are translucent, reflective, or perforated, while others incorporate window and door elements. All these panels filter or reflect light, creating a variety of effects. The translucent screens soften and diffuse light and can become screens for shadow play. The mirrored surfaces reflect images, increase or confound spatial perception, and create reflections that emulate the reflections off of a body of water. The perforated panels recall the mashrabiyas of Middle Eastern architecture. Through them, patterns of light and shadow are created on the surface of the theater. They also become screens behind which characters can hide or appear in semi-light. The host community can personalize the theater by adding to the scenic elements, Skirting panels, curtains, backdrops, awnings, and fabric inserts in the moving panels can all be customizable. Objects and props can be made and placed in the performance space or tied to the sporting structure, all of which is activated by the performers. The theater on the move seeks to create a secular space for ritual to happen through performance. It takes architectural devices and turns them into theatrical elements that can be used to enhance a story. It makes a place of communal gathering and creation. It becomes a place of hospitality between visitors and hosts. The mobile theater proposes multiple layers of placemaking, starting with the large scale and moving down through the details with the final addition of the space activating temporal layer of performance. Finally, we can look at the performance scenario of a traditional Persian folktale, Ketas the Magic Colt. The mobile theater is set up in a three-quarter open stage configuration. The performance takes place during the middle part of the day with the sun high in the sky and shining from behind the theater. The three main settings of the story, a palace, a royal garden, and the desert are delineated by zones in the performance space. The more interior area of the theater becomes a palace where there is less bright light, here, the light is filtered through translucent and perforated screens and sheer curtains. The painted awning with its openings creates the dappled effect of light and shadow found in a garden. The fabric can move with a breeze, further adding to the effect of shimmering foliage. The desert scenes take place in the open sunlight on the dusty ground area, taking full advantage of the brightness and the sense of heat. The topography of the platforms at various heights creates a landscape that allows for movement up and down through the rough terrain of the desert. One of the goals of the theater on the move is to bring beauty to refugee camps to help remind people of its existence in the quotidian world, daylight, breezes, rain, dust, sunrise, sunset, heat and cold, the stars and moon. These phenomena are activated through architectural devices which produce an interactive scenic environment. The goal is to use the mobile theater as a way to engage with the physical world, to find the beauty and hope in that real world. Thank you. In this really amazing and remarkable tour through the arts, we're gonna stay with theater, but a very different perspective on theater now from my dear friend Ismail Khalidi, who is a playwright, theater director, and screenwriter. His plays, including his adaptation with Naomi Wallace of Ghassan Kanafani's Returning to Haifa, have been produced internationally. And in fact, here at Boston University, some of our incredible actors are joining us in the audience today from that staged reading a few weeks ago. He co-edited Inside Out, six plays from Palestine and the Diaspora, he is currently a directing fellow at Pangea World Theater and a visiting artist here at BU's Center on Forced Displacement. Khalidi holds an MFA from NYU Tisch's School of the Arts. And the title is fantastic. Kanafani would have been a rapper, Cultural Resistance and the Radical Palestinian Imagination. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I see some of my students. What's up, students? Yes, um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you all, with my colleagues and comrades. 
Um, and it's been a pleasure to be here this semester uh, as, a, as a guest, as a visiting artist here at the Center on Forced Displacement and in Kilichan. So thank you, Carrie and Muhammad and everybody else. Um, so I want to get, I have a lot of examples that I want to go through, but I probably won't get to share many of them with you. Can you guys hear me? Is that better? I always have this problem because I'm not the tallest dude around. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, so great. So before I start, I want to um, read this um, quote by Robin Kelly. And he says, too often our standards for evaluating social movements pivot around whether or not they succeeded in realizing their visions rather than on the merits or power of the visions themselves. By such a measure, virtually every radical movement failed because the basic power relations they sought to change, re change remained pretty much intact. And yet, it is precisely these alternative visions and dreams that inspire new generations to struggle for change. And that's from his amazing book, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. So I kind of want to play with that idea of radical imagination and use Hassan Kanafani um, as a kind of cipher uh, and to talk about his work and how it has affected generations of Palestinian artists today, all of whom are operating at these borderlands. And for those of you who don't know, and some of my colleagues work, for, uh, Professor De Cuadros in Palestine, know that Palestine has many borders. And like the Southern border, which is here in Boston, uh, the borders which enclose and separate Palestinians are many, whether they're in Gaza, which is an open air prison of two point three million people, uh, which has a fence on the Egyptian side and on the side going into Israel, um, the 19 refugee camps in the West Bank, uh, the immense border wall, apartheid wall that separates the West Bank from 1948 Israel proper. Um, and of course, within every refugee camp, there are walls and, um, and delineations and limitations of movement. Um, am I? Okay. So, so that's to just give a very brief kind of overview of the, the borders which are, um, which divide Palestinians and each of which kind of serves as a canvas um, for different genres. So I wanna talk a little bit about Kanafani. The Palestinian novelist, journalist, painter, and radical Hassan Kanafani in his short but prolific career successfully com combined art, activism, and academia, or at least intellectual rigor and research, because he was uh, not <laughs> a chair at any university. Um, in this sense, he lived and worked across and blurred the frontiers between these worlds. He also operated at other borderlands, those neglected, squeezed, and dissected spaces, which Fanon best described as, quote, a world divided in two, where frequent direct intervention by the police and military ensure the colonized are kept under close scrutiny and contained by rifle butts and napalm. And of course, this is true in the South Bronx and in Palestine and on the US-Mexico border and, and, and in other places. In the case of Kanafani, he operated in the spaces between Beirut and his Palestinian refugee camps, between Lebanon and occupied Palestine, as well as between notions of nationalism and internationalism. I would argue that Kanafani is very much alive today, despite having been assassinated by Israel in 1972 at the age of 36. He was killed in a car bomb by the Mossad alongside his 16-year-old niece. Uh, in that sense, he has become in some ways an iconic Palestinian composite of Tupac and Che, Lomumba and Lorca. The continued circulation of his books and his image are, testam are a testament to this, as is the, the, the degree to which he is seen much like Edward Said, though I would argue more accessible across all sectors of Palestinian society than Said as one of the ones who saw things as they were and saw what was to come and warned Palestinians. Resistance, return, perseverance, and dignity in the face of the constant dismemberment of Palestine were at the center of Kanafani's innovative novels and short stories. Today, I would argue his le legacy directly and indirect 
and indirectly stokes the embers of radical of the radical imagination of Palestinians everywhere. From resistance fighters in Nablus and Janine to rappers to writers, designers, graffiti artists, and film and theater makers. With the situation in Palestine and for Palestinians everywhere as stark perhaps as it has ever been for the Palestinian people and the, and the body politic, the mere feat, I would argue, of holding on to the right of return is, it can be argued, an act of radical imagination. There are many reasons for Kanafeni's lasting influence. Superficially, his swagger, his good looks, and his martyr martyrdom certainly help but his writing, like a classic, classic rap song full of body defiance, directness, and simplicity, paired with double entendres and hidden messages, keeps unfolding, even today, its deeply democratic wisdom with increasing clarity in a way that transcends its datedness. And to give you a quick idea, I want to play a quick... Oh, shit, it's not here. Oh, there it is. Quick clip of Kanafani. And this is an interview at the PFLP offices. He was a spokesman for the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, with an Australian journalist. And uh, I hope you can see the um, subtitles. Oh, it's not, it's not working. Oh, there it is. There it goes. Oh, we have no sound. You know what that is? No. All right, I'll keep going. I don't know how we can. This is an ongoing theme in my time at, at BU, which I have constant technical problems. And as soon as I figure it out, the connections don't work. Um, so my students are- It does know, seem that the war, the civil war has been quite fruitless. It's not a civil war. It's a people defending- But it's, it's just coming, is it just coming out of the um, laptop? Should I put the mic to it? Yeah, let's try. I'm just gonna put the mic to it. All right. Seem that the war, the civil war, has been quite fruitless. It's not a civil war. It's a people defending themselves against a fascist government, which you are defending. It's not a civil war. Well, the conflict. It's not a conflict. It's a liberation movement fighting for justice. Well, whatever it might be best called. It's not whatever, because this is where the problem starts. This is a people who is discriminated, is fighting for his rights. This is a story. Why won't your organization engage in peace talks with the Israelis? You don't mean exactly peace talks. You mean capitulation, surrendering. Why not just talk? Talk to whom? Talk to the Israeli leaders. That's kind of conversation between the sword and the neck, you mean? Well, if there are no swords and no guns in the room, you could still talk. No, I haven't been, I had never seen any talk between a colonialist case and a national liberation movement. But despite this, why not talk? <laughs> talk about what? Talk about the possibility of not fighting. Not fighting for what? Not fighting at all, no matter what for. Yeah, and people usually fight for something and they stop fighting for something. So you can't tell me even why should we speak about what? Well, stop fight fighting. For what? Or, or talk about stop fighting why? Talk to stop fighting to stop the death and the misery, the destruction, the pain. The misery and the destruction and the pain and the death of whom? Of Palestinians, of Israelis, of Arabs. Of the Palestinian people who are uprooted, thrown in the camps, living in starvation, killed for 20 years, and uh, forbidden to use even the name Palestinians. 
They're better that way than dead, though. Maybe to you, but to us, it's not. To us, to liberate our country, to have dignity, to have respect, to have our mere human rights is something as essential as life itself. So that gives you a little taste of Kanafani's swagger, I would argue, and moral clarity. Great. So <clears throat> as Bashir Abu Manne writes, Kanafani understood, and I think this is a great example of this, that language has the potential both to corrupt and exploit and to emancipate. A blind language, to use a phrase that Kanafani dubbed, only serves the powerful and suffocates those who seek to change, who seek change. To defeat it, an effective strategy premised on self-examination and self-critique was needed. A new language had to be imagined. If blind language encourages lamentation and resignation, his language would empower the circulation of democracy through the body politic of the Arab world. What is required of us, he said in 1968, is that we transform the democratic spirit into a daily practice at all levels. I want to talk as briefly as I can about some of his work. So in reading Hassan Kanafani's 1956 letter from Gaza, one can see many of the themes of the author's later work, namely returning to Haifa, which was written in 69, taking form. Kanafani himself, a refugee expelled from the coastal city of Akka in 1948 when he was only 12, was keenly aware of the failures of his parents' generation to avert catastrophe at the hands of British and then Zionist colonization. Kanafani never underplays the threat posed by Zionism nor the odds stacked against the Palestinians in 1948 or thereafter. Rather, he laments the confusion and indecision with which such a menace was confronted during those fateful months of chaos, terror, and ultimately forced removal. And of course, we are almost exactly at the 75 year anniversary of the Nakba. The fictional writer in Letter from Gaza is clearly acting upon this impulse when he pens the following lines to his friend Mustafa, who awaits him in California. No, my friend, I won't come to Sacramento and I have no regrets. Th that obscure, this obscure feeling that you had as you left Gaza, this small feeling must grow into a giant deep within you. It must expand. You must seek it in order to find yourself here among the ugly debris of defeat. I won't come to you. But you, return to us, come back to learn from Nadia's leg, amputated from the top of the thigh, what life is and what existence is worth. The message has much in common with one relayed by Saeed, the protagonist of returning to Haifa to his wife Safiya at the moment of tense anticipation of the looming meeting with their long lost son, Khaldun, now Dove in Israeli. Uh, Almost in a revelatory state, Said feverishly recounts to her the story of Faris al-Lubda, a neighbor of theirs in Ramallah, who has recently returned to his old house in his native Jaffa, only to find a fellow Palestinian living in the house he was forced to abandon 19 years earlier, as opposed to Said and Safiya, who find an Israeli in their house. Faris, in this story, within the story, decides to take back with him to Ramallah the framed photo of his brother and a martyr, Bedir, which he had left hanging on the walls of his house in the intervening years since the Nakba, only to find himself inexplicably turning the car back around towards Jaffa. And upon his second return to his house that night in Jaffa, the man is awaiting Fadis expectantly and tells him, if you want to reclaim Bedir, you have to reclaim the house, Jaffa, us. The picture, it doesn't solve your problem, but it's your bridge to us and our bridge to you. Kanafani masters in both of these examples the subtle plot twist, the revelation and reveal of the decision taken by his protagonist to somehow refuse to do what would be expected or most expedient under their circumstances. By letting us bear witness to the moments when his characters, normal folks like us, come to the realization that they must act in, in the common interest of the Palestinian struggle, as opposed to opting for individual salvation. He is showing us not only a path of greater resistance in both senses, but also one of more profound meaning, both morally and tactically. They are not acts of battlefield heroism, but rather acts of solidarity, kind of micro resistance, acts ranging from something as unsensational as foregoing a planned emigration to California to simply leaving a picture of your brother behind as a bridge between those otherwise separated by walls, checkpoints, and bayonets of the colonial regime. 
In both cases, a kind of proposal is put forward, a pact, if you will, which puts the collective struggle above individual interests by stating, if you stay, I will return, or I will stay so that you can return. They are small acts, yes, at least upon first glance, but the more one considers them, the larger they loom and take on the feel of the heroic. It is as if Canafani manages to create a subgenre of cerebral, slow motion action sequences, or as if he is penning the origin myths of his characters, themselves stand ins for the countrymen and women to who and for whom he is writing, all of whom have roles to play in the battles ahead, armed or otherwise. For all the emphasis put on his support of armed struggle against colonialism, Canafani consistently highlighted the importance of art and literature. In his book, Palestinian resistance literature under occupation, Kanafani argues that the cultural manifestation, quote, of resistance is hugely important, in no way less so than armed resistance itself. Part and parcel of this resistance is for Palestinians to not abandon each other, he argues, not to abandon those who are resisting merely by existing, by remaining and therefore holding vital ground in the face of a many-tiered apartheid apparatus and all of its borders. In this sense, borrowing from Faris al lubdas ter terminology and recognizing the many bridges that exist between the fractured Palestinian people is of crucial importance. Some of these bridges, of course, have long been dilapidated or even deliberately destroyed, while others remain very much intact. The dire circumstances of this moment in Palestine point to the need for the urgent reconstruction of these bridges and the building of new ones so as to create an entirely new infrastructure of return and a reimagining of Palestine, Palestine itself. This call is being answered by gener new generations raised on Kanafani's work. As Barbara Harlow, the scholar and longtime translator of Kanafani's work tells us, it is frequently the younger generations that throughout his writings introduce the quote, historicizing potential inherent in the dynamics of contradiction. Put another way, it is often a young character in Kanafani's work who in the course of a short story or novella mm -hmm. pr quote, provides the liberatory example of, re of refusing the finalities of historical and narrative closure. And I wanna show, before I finish, I wanna show one quick, video of oh, just a minute of a video here. Hi, everyone. Mark Barden here yeah, at Sandy Hook Promise. Capitalism, capitalism. On December 14th, 2012. What was this? My seven year old son, Daniel. I'll skip. Cool. النبي في قومها تقاوم بتفوت محاكم ما حد حيستقبلك في جرامي بيحذفوك في جرامات طماطم مواطن ومغلوب عمر يا ساتر بغني والاستاذ مفيون الشعوب قرض البنوك أسكر ديون اللي حارب الأرض مش يتاب يدعها البلع كله قط يدعها البلع ريد خريف يا ولا خلص البلد شدد البلد حتى لين البلد صير طنبوهات لتحسمس على البلد كشف على البلد شلح البلد سبرينج إز كامينغ فشمس البلد أبو I'll stop it there but just to give you an idea that's Dam which is um, a hip hop group from uh, from 48 so they're they're citizens of Israel Palestinian citizens of Israel so what then <clears throat> Can the young folks in Gaza or Haifa, Akka, Ramallah, Nablus, Jerusalem, or in the di diaspora tell us today? I would argue the same things essentially as they were telling us through Kanafani's pen over half a century ago, and much more. Only by listening to them can new bridges be sturdier and more flexible than the ones built with the rigid and limited building blocks of nationalism alone. 
The bridges being erected today are built of materials infused with global solidarity, with art and culture, with notions of equity, indigeneity, and outrage. They are built with materials more resistant to the elusive wiles and false promises of capitalism and its attendant ills, from patriarchy to militarism, from white supremacy to ecocide, and even the empty virtue signaling of identity politics. The young Palestinians engaging in these acts of resistance and radical imagination know that they must explore and transcend the ugly debris of defeat in order to be able to redefine reimagine, and reimagine themselves, and in turn, reimagine Palestine. So that's all. So I want to show more, but I know we're short on time. So I'll be happy to send uh, those clips to everybody. Um, but as I mentioned before, it's uh, hip hop is obviously one of the, the great vehicles right now for this resistance and this radical imagination, but it's also in theater, it's in film, both in the diaspora and inside historic Palestine, uh, as well as graffiti on the wall in Palestine um, and, and other places. So thank you very much. So next, I'm very, very happy to introduce Leo Iguchi. Um, funny story. Sometimes when you when you depart from your sort of path of research and you know become an English and gender studies professor who's helping to start a center on forced displacement, um, you actually find it's going to return you home. And Marina, our incredible director of programs, saw Leo play, said, Carrie, Mohammed, you need to learn about Leo Iguchi. And it turns out I went to high school with Leo. Um, and so it's been such a pleasure to reconnect with him in this context. Um, with that said, Leo Iguchi is on the music faculty of Boston College and is the assistant conductor of the MIT Symphony Orchestra. His degrees include a BM for cello performance and a BS in physics, cum laude, from the University of Michigan, Michigan and an MM in cello performance from Boston University, where he received the String Department Award for Excellence. Recent solo performing highlights include being a prize winner at the 2021 Pro Cello International Cello Competition, several Grammy-nominated recording releases from Parma Recordings, multiple concerto appearances, and an artist residency and solo performances in Kabul, Afghanistan. Please join me in welcoming Leo Iguchi. Do you want to start with the clip? Why don't I talk first? Great. Hi, and uh, thank you to Carrie and everyone here. It's good? Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about a project called the Unaccompanied Project, um, which is <clears throat> something that both was born uh, recently and had sort of been percolating in me my whole life. Um, it's, uh, the, it's recent Genesis has a lot to do with, um, the tensions, uh, with the border wall that we have been speaking of, um, the rise of Asian hate, uh, over the last five years. But as I was grappling with these questions as an artist, I realized, uh, that there were questions inherent to it that go back, you know, as far back as I can remember. And I think that um, when we try to have conversations about these qu questions now, um, it feels impossible, right? It feels like you try to have a conversation about immigration with um, someone and either they agree with you or they don't agree with you. If you try to actually have conversation, it, you butt up against everyone's sort of predetermined talking points and you sort of have a jousting match that slightly dehumanizes everybody, but you don't actually make any progress on changing any minds. So uh, as I was thinking about this and how to actually um, bring humanity back into the immigration conversation, um, I, was, I sort of looked inward and thought about the questions for myself. And um, as Carrie mentioned, I, we grew up together in Michigan, 
before I moved to the town where Carrie and I grew up, I lived in a, a much smaller rural town where there weren't any Asian people. And as I think many people in this room can um, relate to, when you grow up in an immigrant household, um, there are sort of multiple answers to every question. You know, there are, there's, there's the answer that's true at school. There's the answer that's true at home. There's the answer that's true if you have the, the luxury of going to your heritage country. Um, and they're all true, but they're, they're not quite the same. And when you put words to them, it's sort of unsatisfying. <laughs> so as I was grappling with this question of what, what immigration means to this country and what it means to me, um, I started asking myself, what does, it, what does it mean for me to be an American? Um, and I was interested to hear what some other um, artists of uh, other experiences had to say on that also. So um, from that comes the immigration, uh, the, excuse me, the unaccompanied project for which I asked eight um, composers who are either immigrants themselves or first generation Americans to answer that question. What does your Americanness sound like? Um, and if you could, you know, trying to get at sort of one encapsulation of what your experience means. And um, the results have been um, very stimulating for me, um, not least of all because um, several took me to task on the clumsiness of the question. Mm -hmm. um, what is Americanness? You know, that's. Uh, the United States does not own the word America. Um, several uh, rejected the question entirely and said, you know, I am the sum of my parts and my experiences. And I would have written this piece for you if you had just asked me to write you a piece, period. You know, I just am the artist I am. Um, all of which I think is an absolutely valid answer to the question. But um, in putting each of these pieces together into one um, concept, I think um, we get a sort of overview of different humanizing experiences, but also musical vocabularies and artistic viewpoints that I hope um, allow us to look inwards, learn a little bit more about ourselves and what that question is for us and what the various answers are, um, as well as uh, sort of get beyond ourselves and um, listen to each other a little bit better. So um, I thought I might play one of the selections for you today. Um, it is by Milad Yusufi, a young uh, Afghan refugee living in this country. Um, just a few words about Milad. Um, he, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Milad in, um, uh, as Carrie read in my bio, I did um, a residency in Kabul at the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. Um, at a time when Kabul was a sort of um, a sort of bubble of security and um, opportunity and hope for what could be for the future. Um, obviously, that was short-lived, but um, I um, I have loved following the music students that were there as they have. Um, luckily, mostly um, gotten out. And in Milad's case, um, he is thriving in New York um, as a composer making his way, and yet um, has to, again, live this sort of dual answer where everything is true, but in on completely different levels. You know, when, when I premiered the uh, Unaccompanied Project in the fall, uh, Milad was scheduled to be with us and, and to, to talk in a group conversation afterwards. And the last minute he had to cancel because he had uh, an immigration hearing that day. Um, so uh, I, I hope you enjoy Milad's piece. Um, each of the pieces in the unaccompanied project uh, when I play them is preceded by uh, a short video of the composers speaking of themselves and their experience. Um, so that the focus is on them and their story and you can humanize them um, hearing their voice and seeing their face. Um, so I think if we could run, run Milad's little introduction video, I'll set up to play and hope you enjoy.
Yes. <laughs> Isma, what have you done? Okay. Okay, let me try again. Hello everyone, my name is Miladius Fi. I am a pianist, composer, and visual artist. The piece and courage is inspired by many events in Afghanistan, especially current events that has happened during the past year. I have completed and courage within one and a half years. And in this piece, I wanted to show the beauty of our music, the roots, and also I wanted to connect it to my synesthesia. As you can see, the sketches, uh, uh, it's inspired by many colors that I've seen uh, throughout the process of this piece. And uh, I wanted to also express uh, the struggle the refugees and immigrants are going through through this piece uh, by using different scales that I've experienced and played in myself. Hope you enjoy the piece and thank you very much.
Yeah. Miraculously, these incredible five speakers and artists have left us time for conversation. Um, that is really incredible given the circumstances. Can I invite them all up? Where we
Preston. Hello, thank you all for uh, speaking today. Um, my question is for Professor Sharon, is it? Oh, you can call me Isla, please. Isla, please. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, Isla, I know this question doesn't really pertain to force displacement necessarily, but just out of curiosity, I'm wondering if you are familiar with any efforts similar to the ones you presented on when it comes to like gerrymandering, because those are borders that have a lot of space for activism in and of itself. And I'm just curious if you've seen the arts intersect with gerrymandering at all. That is, that is a really good question. Um, I will say I'm sort of this is a new project that I'm embarking upon, so I haven't, you know, thought about maybe analogs in other situations, um, you know, so directly. Um, that being said, I mean, I there are, in terms of gerrymandering specifically, I don't have names off the top of my head, but thinking about sort of the internal borders and political borders of different cities, I know St. Louis, where I'm based, um, there are a, a great number of artists and activists and organizations working to kind of re sort of reconfigure the political landscape um, and thinking in terms of borders and divides. And I'm definitely happy to talk with you, you know, more directly about this afterwards because I think um, you know it, it could be definitely worth a larger conversation. Um, so I, I mean. I do, like I said, I do think that there are absolutely analogs and even those that deal with sort of the physical or material, um, you know, work of the city. Uh, but I do know gerrymandering is a much larger and sometimes abstract political um, issue that doesn't necessarily leave boundaries or material traces in it. I actually um, had a question earlier, but then I was rendered speechless by the lack of performance. And for some reason, just uh, felt an overwhelming urge to cry, um, which I think kind of connects to my question about methods. Um, and and all of you are coming to it from um, as a social scientist and using very different kinds of methods. And um, I think my own reaction to the music at the end tells me a little bit about what the kinds of methods that and approaches that you're um, uh, taking are, are able to transmit to an audience that the written word alone, especially in an academic kind of framing that isn't able to do. But I think, yeah, the, the question is kind of about, you know, what's most liberating um, about the kinds of methods you use and also, um, yeah, what's most liberating, what's most exciting and achievable, and then also the limitations and, um, and for Andre, I, I was so taken by um, two things. One, the, the masks. I thought that was really interesting. I wonder if you might expand on that project. Of, um, because I've seen uh, Noelle Bridgen, who we invited for a previous um, Sawyer seminar. She, she's a political scientist who has respondents draw maps and sort of thinking. And I think she expected something very different from what she, she received in, in maps. And you mentioned a little bit about visibility and visibility. I just found it really um, thought provoking. I wonder if you could expand on that. And then the last thing I'll say, which is more of a comment, I was taken in your talk about the things that were most haunting were actually not necessarily experiences, but what people had witnessed. Um, and you said something in passing of like the screams in prisons in, in Boston and how you can't unhear that or this, the corpse and, and that individual who can't unsee it. So I wonder if uh, you can say something about kind of bearing with it. Dearly, you asked me a so lot many. of uh, <laughs> penetrating questions. I think, uh, I, I think the idea of, I mean, if any of you work with masks, you know how how uh, you can you can tell stories. You can story yourself. You can reveal your hiddenness that you can't otherwise. And I think we work with queer refugees more so than with others, people who've been systemically victims of sexual violence and other forms of violence. I think uh, the masks offer a space for telling themselves in a way that almost nothing else I've discovered can. Mm. And so all the other things that we do, in other words, you know, what I was saying last week with the refugees from uh, Haiti, 
uh, and so on. The kinds of stories that they can tell poetically, now uh, through music and so on, are uh, uh, given an extra dimension through the through masks. And uh, uh, I mean, if you if you do that with kids, I mean, if you do this with with, with elementary school kids, you know that that people become different of themselves, right? So that's one thing. The idea, the other thing about the about the summer of the rainbow, which is positioning the work within an interrogative. So the interrogative, like I said before, is the happy little bluebird fly beyond the rainbow, which is really why I like so much what uh, what you were saying about you know the thing about radical imagination and and so this idea of freedom dreaming, which is anchored in the long arc of African American struggle, but it's also it is in the long arc of black and brown freedom movements all over the world. And, and you see this in borders and wars and so on. And so we, the, the people I work with in prisons in Boston would say, we are not society's trash. We are not invisible. But the segregation of society in, in, in the United States has rendered them invisible. And that's what the border does. It renders people invisible and not only invisible, but then they are forced to be, to hide themselves in high dimensions of themselves. And, and so I think that these are complex and, and that's why the, I mean, I work in the social sciences too. So but it, my point, my work in, is, is where the social sciences, the social sciences intersect with the arts. Because I find the social sciences are fantastic and, but, and the arts are also fantastic because they create the space for the imaginary. Mm. And, uh, and when, when, when they intersect together, we can create the narratives, create the stories, look at them, create space, we express itself, and then study how that's working. What can, what can these narratives and stories tell us about who we work with and how, the, how that works? Which is what Leo's work and, and, and my two wonderful colleagues there doing. Are these, these ways in which people tell and story and identify and so forth? Sorry for that long answer to your wonderful question. But sorry, I apologize to my other panel members for my long answer. I wonder if I could pick up on um, what I think was, was there in Nora's great question. Um, and what I'm responding to so powerfully with, with this panel is like the dizzying array of modes and media and approaches and genres represented like in one paper, um, but then across the panel. So. If you might speak, we're an interdisciplinary audience, an interdisciplinary center. What do you feel your modes, your genres, and your artistic medium, your disciplines even, offer to the conversation? And I'd love to hear from each of you. And since Andre has already started, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else want to go? second microphone. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, my my dad's a history professor, and I explicitly decided to go into theater in order to kind of explore the same questions historically and politically, but without having to always cite my sources. So I think <laughs> it gives you a certain freedom, uh, and that doesn't mean the work is separate. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I guess. I'm I'm constantly in, in my work and the work that I kind of um, in the world that I circulate in, um, you know, I'm constantly reminded of this, and it kind of relates to the question of, of the masks and that kind of the silencing of a quote by Arun Dati Roy, in which she said, you know, there's there's actually no such thing as the voiceless. There's only uh, the uh, uh, silence, the, the uh, intentionally silence, mm -hmm. and the preferably unheard. Uh, and I think, you know, you know artists, uh, art in general, and all of these genres give, give us that ability that sometimes the social, social sciences don't, and sometimes the kind of gatekeepers of, of mass media don't allow. Um, and I think of, you know, writers like Galliano, who some of my students have read this, this year, mm -hmm. uh, as, as uh, Eduardo Galliano, as, as great examples of that, Aranda um, Viroy as well. 
um, uh, to kind of circumvent the mediums, as it were. Sure. On. Oh, there yeah. we go. <laughs> Green light. Um, oh. mm. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so, um, I really love being part of this panel because of that diversity of media that are represented, and and especially the focus on merits. Um, one little tiny line in my bio was um, that I'm sort of a co-PI on an interdisciplinary project called Moving Stories, in which we're really trying to understand how narratives function in stories of migration and how they can bridge gaps between um, a, a, a migration a migrating population and the kind of host or the, the in the country of settlement or in the region of settlement. Um, and one of the, I think, disciplinary questions we've come up against, so our, our group has me, the art historian, we have someone from Romance Languages, we have a sociologist, we have an artist, and we have a designer. And this is part of you know, a much larger, hopefully, project. I mean, we were funded for about a year and a half, but we are intending to go on and kind of have um, a digital platform component to think broadly about the collection of, of narratives. And one of the, the questions that we brought to the table is this, this issue of um, disciplinary flexibility. Right, and how how can a sociologist study narratives? And, and our sociologist, that is her, I mean, that is her research, but she's never thought about different artistic components of a narrative or a narrative in sound or music, like we've just heard today. Um, and so how can we bring people together? So, I mean, I, I recognize the limitations of my own discipline as an art historian. You know, I'm telling narratives about specific artworks. I am bringing them together in dialogue with each other, but I don't have the social, social science background to really understand quantitatively what's going on. Um, and so I see a future in kind of bringing people together along these disparate disciplinary lines and thinking through these questions more broadly. Um, that being said, in my own work and what I presented today, it was much more about dealing with a variety of artworks that would still be labeled and legible as visual art or performed or created by artists and professional artists for that matter. Um, not to say that there isn't a place for community-engaged work, and in fact, that's a whole other arm of my research, but I'm also interested in what professional training, you know, what, what artistic training can do in these situations. What does it mean for an artist who is educated in that discipline or, you know, considers themselves a professional artist to, you know, to make a commentary and to kind of elucidate a really complex situation? So it's a very long answer. Um, but thinking, I mean, I, I'm really interested in the way that different disciplinary approaches can you know, activate different parts of what is a you know, situation that cannot be encapsulated by one, by, by one approach. Um, yeah. Oh, you have to slide it and then hit it again. Good. Okay. Um, well, for me, as not as a social scientist, but as an artist, I I think that the different media like different languages, um, and uh, you can express the same thought in in each language, but it's it comes out a little differently. And and just just like as an anecdote, uh, Carrie and I were talking about this actually recently. Uh, so, you know. I growing up in my household, uh, we spoke. There was Japanese and there was English, but Japanese was always the language of discipline, and it, it's a language that lends itself very well to that. And so I was resistant to speaking that Japanese back. You know, I answered everything. In, yeah, I'm being yelled at in Japanese. I speak in Japanese, um, and I think hip hop is an excellent language for rage for protest. I think that um, what you say in a symphony, uh, can, you know, you have so many different tools and vocabularies, but they all have different sort of colors to them. Um, uh, like a solo cello piece about the wall would have a very different impact than the teeter-totters. Um, 
So I think, um, you know, what impact each of these disciplines has and how it's received on the NIH, you can want to look at the, the numbers about how it, how it reaches people and what effects are had. But I, I'm very interested in the way that the, um, the different vocabularies um, get to people in different ways and, and cause a, a different reception. Yeah, I guess I'm dealing more with just the visual space environment uh, with the project I was showing. Um, and it's more a question of creating a space that is comfortable where people can come together and and tell their stories, where a host community and the the guests can also share because there's actually that kind of situation that you find in uh, these in a refugee camp or in these other places, you have the people who are the refugees, but you also have the host community. And this is a place where they can also come together and share and, and tell each other stories. And um, it's it's more trying to create an environment where this activity can happen as a, and and allowing others to um, make it their own. In, in however they want to shape it with whatever type of performance they want to, whether it's drama, whether it's music, whether it's dance, stories. Yeah. A little more time. Why not have to teach? Mm -hmm. um, well, how about that? Yeah, there we go. It occurs to me that you're all either producing or studying what might be called public art or art that aims to have some sort of effects, political or otherwise. Um, I just finished reading Dora Summer on kind of the work of art in the world. And which just has me meditating on this question, um, what can art do? Um, and it occurs to me that you're all looking at art that at least aims to do something, because there's this long intellectual lineage that says that art should do nothing, but clearly that's not where you are. So I guess here's my question. Um, how either confident are you or hopeful are you that the art that you're either producing or studying is going to have some sort of political effect, or maybe just an effect, even if it's not a political effect? Yeah. That's my question. <laughs> I like passing. Yeah, first of all, I mean the idea, even the idea of art, is a is a Eurocentric epistemology it's construction that uh, the, this thing there's a thing called art, right? So, so just let's say that is a first premise. The second premise is that there's an idea amongst in the Western Academy or the Western Canon that 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 art. It comes comes from the Athenian concept of beauty. That's the art is externalized as something for contemplation and so on, right? But as we know that that human beings have been constructing and making the thing we call art for over seventy thousand years in all kinds of ways. There's no such thing as art for nothing, you know. And the, or the, what does the art do when it's doing nothing? Uh, you, you know, because everything has a purpose. All art, the fact that we Art survives so long is because we are hardwired to tell stories, to imagine, to to create, to look at stars and and make meaning from from things that somebody else may not make meaning from. And that's essentially what the art, what arts, the arts do. It's connected to ritual, to all the kinds of things that 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 register us as human beings. And and so whether that's consolation or Beauty mobilization, or protest, or or sadness, uh, with grief, or loss, or or supremacy, or elitism. That's what the arts do. All of that. I mean, it's like a, there's there's no such thing as, as nothing. So, I mean, so you're talking about effect. What what effect? I mean, 
we, 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 I mean, we, we in the in the in the in cognitive sciences, we're still trying to figure out, and people are really saying, well, what with the F fMRIs, what happens to when the limbic system, the limbic system, when when certain musics are played, and so on. We don't need that science to confirm that arts, the arts, have an effect. We know it. Nora gave us evidence just now. Your place is fantastic, please. Uh, Nora wants to cry. Maybe you didn't want to cry, and maybe somebody else wanted to laugh, and somebody else was in another zone. But it is impossible not to be touched, moved, transformed in some way. We don't need confirmation in the social sciences to tell us that. I mean, so I take, I take some distance with your question. I mean, I like your question very much. It's the <laughs> subject of a book, really, and uh, but. But I think we that's where we kind of really perhaps want to resist this kind of notion. We have a we have a conservatory in this university which is dedicated to producing the, the art that they regard as apolitical. There is no such thing as apolitical art. The art that we make in this university on the whole, it's not public, it's private, excludes the homeless, excludes stories of the kinds of stories that Leo is telling, right? I mean. That's what that's in American conservatory is a hallmark of exclusionary violence, systemic, structural kind of representations of violence. So we have to also consider that too. Uh, sorry, once again, for a long answer. To <laughs> yeah, I, I'll echo that. I mean, I think, you know, Marvel movies are about nothing and they're also full of in my opinion, nefarious, insidious political content that's really about, you know, machismo and patriarchy and militarism, you know? Um, so I think everything is about something. Yeah. And even, you know, the, your love triangle in Brooklyn, Williamsburg play is about something, even if it's numbing people, right? Um, I talk about high school up there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I... I don't know. I also just came, I just had uh, my adaptation of Returning to Haifa for the stage produced in, in Minneapolis uh, at a small theater. And, you know, we had three, you know, houses of 150 people who I would say, you know, 400 of them, you know, so that's 450 total over the course of a weekend. 400 of them had probably never heard of Hassan, right? Mm. right? 400 of them, 300 of them probably didn't know what Haifa was, and if they did, they thought it was just some Israeli city where you go after you go and, like, you know, buy sh schlocky shit in, in Jerusalem, you know, when you go to the Holy Land. So are they going to call their representative? I mean, like, it's also about the definition of political change, right? Are they going to call their, is, is legislation going to be written now? Probably not. But are those, is that little chain reaction maybe going to happen or that, that amazing piece where uh, the wall is superimposed on um, the the Mexico wall is superimposed on places. I mean, to me, those are the those are those kind of microscopic chain reactions that happen in, in daily life. And you can look at the Charles River and be like, oh, I imagine a wall there, or I hear that Haifa, and I don't think of a tourist destination. I think of you know this ninety five percent of Haifa's Palestinian population that was expelled in the course of two days in 1948, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think they do, it does, you know, it does have an effect. Yeah. Can I jump in really quick? I mean, I, I completely, I, I, I hear both of you. I think you're absolutely right. And just to add that politics is aesthetic. I mean, we don't, we cannot remove the political from the aesthetic because even the choice to name the wall a wall when it is not a wall, and then people get banned and be like, well, it's actually a fence, but no, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wall, right? And the imaginary is a wall. And so there needs to be, and you know, there is an aesthetic playing field on which all of these conversations are taking place. And we shouldn't see the background because there is always going to be an aesthetic effort to categorize migrants or again just people the other right um so what happens what happens if we see that one mm -hmm. um so i'm looking at artists who refuse to see that room and i think yeah my colleagues up here are as well 
I would, um, I, and yes, everyone, and um, I, I mean, when I, um, when I started my unaccompanied project, I really, um, I wanted it to have an effect. Uh, it was a project of hope to, um, to engage with conversations that are broken. Um, and um, well, well, I don't live in a fairy tale about it. I'm, you know, it's not a magic wand, but it felt like a step um, to being able to understand each other and ourselves better. Um, that wasn't wasn't happening enough, and I I agree. There's no art about nothing, but I would also say um, let's be back here. A little amendment, um, or, or shall I say another yes and to what Professor De Quadros said, I am a product of the conservatory, you know, three blocks down. Um, and uh, there's a, you know, and I think that in these conversations, um, it's our responsibility to hold on to that and to know that um, I'm trying to change your mind and I, I am coming to where you are also in this conversation. We know that we're actually two humans talking to each other. Um, and I, I feel like that's important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the hope, for the refusal to see the ground, for making space for art and theater and conversation for playing for us, for giving to us. This is truly incredible. Please join me in thanking this. <laughs> we have a moment for refreshments and to stretch and to move a little bit. And actually we're gonna go straight in to our next yes. thing. No problem. Yeah, the moment for refreshment comes after beautiful question. storytelling. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we would ask everyone to um, stay here. Yeah, we'll move to I think it's so tough giving a lecture was much easier than doing it. Much tougher, right? <laughs>